Hey, welcome back to the place where energy matters. And if you want to catch up on what's gone before, just click in the top corner right now. And in this video, I'm gonna cover off the larger appliances that typically use more energy. So before we get into the details of this video, I just want to cover off a couple of things that have happened since the last episode. So the first thing on the list was the energy price cap increase expected on the 1st of October. Now the initial figures were pretty scary, but luckily for us, the government have actually stepped in and given us an energy price guarantee. So the figure of 2,500 that's been quoted against this is for typical usage on a dual fuel tariff paying by direct debit. So it may change a lot and it actually depends on how much energy you would use anyway. So I've just popped up the details from my current supplier, which is Bulb. And as you can see, electricity prices have jumped from 28p to around 34 a slight increase again in the standing charge. When it comes to gas, it's gone up from about 7.5 to 10.5p per kilowatt hour, and the standing charge has slightly increased as well. Uh, this is typical, though, of where the prices have landed, because I'm on the default tariff, so this comes under the government's energy price guarantee. So the next thing I wanted to mention is what's been covered in the press recently, and the fact that the UK is at significant risk of gas shortages over the winter period. So for me, I'm not entirely sure whether this is actually just a call to action from the media to get the government to do something, or whether there is genuine concern that there will be rolling blackouts over the winter period. So I'm not usually someone that subscribes to scaremongering or panic buying situations. So for example, like petrol and diesel panic buying, and also during the pandemic, pasta and toilet roll, etc. But I do like to be prepared for certain situations. So if you do want to prepare and have some kind of coverage over the period, then I suggest that you actually go round and find out all the appliances you want to run. And then what you can do is note down how many watts they use to get some kind of idea. Starting with the basics, what you need to understand is how much your appliances or devices consume. So you can do this by looking in the owner's manual. You can do this by looking at the labels that are attached to power bricks or on the back of devices or appliances. And they will give you an idea of how much they consume when they're being used. So you need to start with this to get an understanding really of how big you need your off-grid system for what you want to run. So the bigger the system, the bigger the cost usually, and the more that you can actually save when the sun is shining. So just make a list figure out what you want to run, and then just total up the amount of watts you want to run, and then you can actually calculate any kind of system that you want. And again, it doesn't have to be solar powered. As long as you can plug it into the mains while there's power around, you can actually fill up any kind of battery system or all-in-one system, and then use that energy should any blackouts occur. So if you do have any questions on how to make that list or how to actually size some kind of system to actually cover what you need, just pop it in the section below and I'll respond as soon as I can. So back to the main topic of this video, and I'm gonna cover off three of my larger appliances, sometimes termed white goods, even though they're not actually white in color anymore, and actually gonna go through how I run them, what I've found for the size of system that I need to run them, and also how you can calculate how to do the same for yourself if you wish to run any of these appliances off solar power, or actually run them off backup power by using cheaper grid energy. So the first appliance, and probably my most essential one, is my Beko fridge freezer. Now there's a little label inside which gives you the details, and you can also find this in the owner's manual as well. But as you can see, this one uses 80 watts or 0.24 of an amp. Now in actual fact, if you times 0.24 of an amp by 230 volts, which is a typical main supply voltage, you'll see that it actually comes out at 96.6 watts. So in actual fact, 80 watts on there isn't actually true. So on the surface, it seems fairly simple to actually size some kind of all-in-one system or a battery and an inverter combo to actually power a fridge freezer, but it's not quite that simple. Pretty much like microwaves, it's not what it says on the tin. So when it comes to appliances such as fridges, freezers and air conditioning units as an example, they have what's called a compressor on board. And this helps to move refrigerant, which is effectively a gas, from one zone to another, moving heat out of that zone to somewhere else. So for example, like on a fridge, it's always cooler on the inside because it takes the heat out of the fridge and moves it to a little radiator at the back, which is something you can sometimes feel when it's in operation. The back's always warmer than inside. So the only drawback with compressors is the fact they need a lot of initial startup current or amps to get them going. So this is sometimes referred to as a surge current. So when it comes to sizing an inverter or an all-in-one system in order to run a fridge, you need to try and calculate how much startup current the compressor needs. 
Now I couldn't find anything on paper for my Beko one, so I actually used my energy monitoring plug to find out. So as I couldn't predict when the compressor was going to kick in, what I did was I set up my energy monitoring plug and then filmed it, just to see how many amps it actually spiked up to. So here's what I filmed, and as you can see I've just propped it up on the back of one of my jackeries to keep it upright. But what you'll see is the fact in a minute it's just going to kick in, and there we go, we've got 6.151 amps. So if you actually times that particular figure by 227 volts, which is what my AC200P kicks out, which is what this was connected to at the time, we get to a figure of around 384 watts. So that's quite a massive surge. So this is the reason why 500 watt solar generators and portable power stations couldn't handle this. That brief surge is way too much and always trips the inverters. So as you can see it continuing on, it does start to settle down to almost exactly around the 0.42 amps as it was shown on the label inside the fridge. So it seems to need a period to calm down and I was interested to see these results, I wasn't expecting that to happen. So when it came to my results I was surprised. I wasn't expecting the surge current to go as high as it did. Okay, there's a reliance on accuracy for my energy monitoring plug, but this explains why only my systems rated at 1000 watts or more were able to run my fridge properly. And this also explains that when I did test with smaller units such as my Jackery Explorer 500 and my All Powers 666 watt hour, that the inverters tripped out almost immediately when the compressor kicked in. So this is a clear indicator in my case that even though my fridge runs at just under 100 watts when it's got going, that it needs somewhere in the region of 1400 watts in terms of power, again assuming around a 230 volt input at 6.1 amps, which is incredible. And this may be a reason that if you want to run your fridge freezer that you need to make sure that you've got a plug and you check exactly how much current it needs when it starts up. So next up is my slimline dishwasher. I've got a slimline dishwasher that I saved from a skip. Yes, I actually did that. So here it is about eight years on from its rescue. Yes, it still works. Yes, it's getting rusty. Yes, the tray's wheels have mostly fallen off, which means it's difficult to get things in and out. And unfortunately, it doesn't really clean properly in eco mode anymore, meaning I've got to use the highest setting, which is 65 degrees C. So it does use quite a bit of energy, but it still works. So when it comes to sizing a system and an inverter size, the energy monitoring plug is really useful because what it can do is it can tell you the highest or the peak amount of watts used on any kind of appliance that it's plugged into. So for example on here it used 2160 watts at peak through a 1 hour and 22 wash cycle. So what this really tells me about using my dishwasher is the fact that I need a system that has a 2000 watt or more inverter. So I can't get away with using my smaller systems, even my EB150 for example, or my Jackery Explorer 1000, because they're just not going to have that stretch range in terms of peak wattage that I really need to be able to run it. So something else I've learned about dishwashers is the fact that they use a lot of energy. So even if you've got a more modern one, a more efficient one, that obviously you can use in eco mode, they still chew through a lot of power. So I'll just show you what mine typically uses. Again, I have to use it in the highest setting in terms of heat. So my typical setting on here would give me 1.24 kilowatt hours used. Now that's quite a lot really for just a basic and a slimline one in my case. But again, if you need to save power and you don't have solar or you haven't got backup power available as in cheaper off grid, you really need to consider how much you use your dishwasher because it does use a lot of power. So last but not least is my washer dryer. I have an integrated washer dryer that's never been integrated and the dryer has stopped working. So this one's been really interested in the fact that the dryer doesn't work so I haven't got to worry about that. But this is rated at 1500 watts. So what I have found is the fact that I can do cold washes as you can see at the moment on screen with my Jackery Explorer 1000 because it's got enough uh, peak range in there, so meaning going over or peaking above the 1000 watt mark for short periods, to be able to run it in cold wash mode. So the moment you add heat into the equation, as in heating the water to 30, 40, 60 or even 90 degrees for a wash, that means your inverter size needs to go up, and this is what I found with mine. So really I can only use the Explorer 1000 for cold washes, but anything else like higher than that and running anything from a 30 or 40, which is normally what I run outside of when I do cold washes, 
I have to use my AC200P or my self-build five kilowatt hour DIY battery with my 3000 watt solar inverter. That's the only way I can run it in those modes. So if you do want to size a system or inverter to actually run your washing machine, then again the same principles apply as I've shown on the dishwasher in the fact that if you look at the peak wattage when you're plugged into the normal mains to get an idea of what your washing machine goes up to, that gives you an idea of the size of inverter or system that you're going to need. So there you have it. A brief look at the energy price guarantee, a potential for rolling blackouts over the winter period, and an idea of how to size a system to run your larger appliances off off-grid energy. So if you do have any comments, questions or suggestions about future videos in this series, please pop them in the section below and I'll respond as soon as I can. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to DaVinci. Da